All right, let's apply what we learned so far into some engineering devices, okay? And the things that I'm going to focus on will be steady because they, they really are in the application space, okay? As you see the title, the first one is the nozzle and the diffuser. Um, so I actually want to go ahead and uh, draw that for you, the, the shape of it. So a nozzle is typically like this, okay? And if I have my system, the system will be right here, okay? The goal of a nozzle is I have one inlet over here, okay? I have some particular uh, flow rate, M.1, right? Um, and the goal is to increase my velocity, okay? The shape that I'm showing you is on the logical for subsonic flow. If my flow is supersonic, actually the shape of it will be reversed, so it will be expanding. I just want to note that. But for the thermodynamics applications, most of the time we go to this type of uh, an, an arrangement, subsonic flows. We have this in jet engines, the rockets, and the diffuser is actually the reverse of it, okay, in terms of the goal. And I will talk about that a little bit more. But the diffuser like opens it up, okay? And once it opens it up, what happens is the, the velocity goes down because the area goes up. And I'll explain why that happens in a minute, okay, after I draw. So this is a, a nozzle, this is a diffuser, okay? Um, again, both for subsonic flows, the shape wise. Let's take a look at what's happening over here, conservation of mass principle. Let's take, just pick up the nozzle first. Um, you would agree with me when I say this, right? Nothing will be uh, contained within a nozzle. And let's say that this is a, a, a pressure washer nozzle. They have different nozzles right at the tip of it. You can see over here, this M dots will be the same. As the M dots will be the same, then row 1, V1, A1 will be equal to row 2, A2, V2, right? I, I, I should have wrote, written the way around, but that's fine. So we can go ahead and simply say that the densities for fluids will be constant or in terms of the liquids, but gases, they're not going to range a lot, so I'm going to assume that they are the same. If not, you can incorporate that into your analysis. It's not a big deal. But the point I'm making over here is the velocity inverse is inversely proportional to the area. You can clearly see in here is A2 is smaller than A1, isn't it? So then V2 will be larger than V1. And that's the whole point of having a nozzle. My nozzle is going to increase the velocity. And think about like what I told you, the pressure washer. The, the whole goal is to have, so I have more uh, velocity outside so I can clean whatever the surface I'm cleaning in a better uh, format, okay? Um, so, and typically in this kind of case, um, this comes from fluid mechanics, but P2 will be less than P1, so my, my pressure reduces. And a typical, not always, typical sense, when the velocity increases, pressure reduces, okay, they are immersive um, related to each other. The diffuser, on the other hand, I'm not going to do the same thing again, but you can see this A2 is this time around is larger than A1, so what happens is my V2 will be large, smaller than V1. Okay, and this also means that P2 is larger than P1, right, um, from the same logic. So you can see what's happening over here. So you can think of a diffuser as like an opposite to a nozzle, okay. And the, these, the, both diffusers and nozzles are very common. I gave the example of jet engine, and you can think about this uh, typically when a jet engine for, um, let's say that we have Boeing 747, and the speed that it travels is like 550 miles per hour or something like that, okay, so very, very high. So if I have air coming in, in here, my goal is to have a first a diffuser before the turbine and all. We didn't talk about that, but the first stage is to have a diffuser so I can reduce the velocity because it's too fast, so I need to reduce it. Or you can look at even the hair dryers, okay, it has nozzles and diffusers, so multiple, multiple applications of these very simple devices, okay. Also, why don't we analyze the mass, uh, we did the mass flow rate, why don't we analyze the energy, okay? So if we do that, what we will have is, um, actually, let me go back and copy paste the equation, so I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So basically, I just uh, copy pasted one inlet, one outlet uh, conservation of energy principle, or the first law of thermal, right? Um, so in these kind of devices, typically, not always, but typically, I'm going to neglect the uh, heat transfer, there's no work in or out from the system. And the potential energy, even if it is uh, tilted, will be very small compared to others. I made a point about it in the last segment, how small they can be, okay? But the velocities, as the velocities are changing, they can be significant, so I'm not gonna go ahead and ignore that, okay? So you can see from this equation that the left-hand side is zero, 
So then this either m dot will be zero or the multiplication of this one or rather this term will be zero. M dot cannot be zero because then there's nothing that is flowing. That's not a you know active uh, device. So then this parentheses must be zero for this to be satisfied. So it says that h e plus v e square by two is, will be equal to h i plus v i square by two. Okay. Um, you know I said that the, the shape is like this for a nozzle, right? So I can increase my velocity. But uh, is that, I said that this is for subsonic. So we have something called, I just want to illustrate how complicated these can get, okay? I have something called uh, converging diverging nozzles, okay? And I what, what I can do is, um, in a, this is where I have is uh, basically subsonic region over here. My goal is to get supersonic. So once I increase actually the velocity increases over here, and this is called the travel. And so the, uh, you know I'm not going to explain the whole foot mechanics here, but uh, I can increase the velocity even further with this. So I can start with subsonic, I can end with supersonic. And you may think this is a very simple device, but depending on whether I know what I'm doing or not, the flow over here can be choked. I can have shock in this shock waves going into the nozzle. I can have shocks at the exit myself. I can have overexpanded section over here, so I will get supersonic or mix sub, sub and supersonic flow with some waves in it. I can have underexpanded in terms of over here, and I can get uh, supersonic with waves in the different directions, and also it can get real complicated. I just want to highlight that. Although these devices seem very simple and uh, easy, it can get dense, okay? Okay, let's go ahead and solve two questions. The first question is going to look like this. Steam at 500 kilopascal and 200 Celsius. So basically, my pressure and temperature is given. So now I know my state, okay? And it's steam. And there's an adiabatic. What does adiabatic mean? It means the Q is equal to zero, right? Heat transfer. Nozzle, I know the shape now. And the goal is to increase the velocity, right? With the velocity, in velocity is 30 meter per second. Determine the temperature and the quality. Obviously, if applicable, it's not applicable in uh, everywhere, only in the steam dome, right? Quality of the steam at exit. If it leaves the nozzle at 200 kilopascal, so you see what happened in the nozzle, as I mentioned previously, the pressure reduced, the velocity significantly increased, so I can use, use that, okay? Um, all right, so let's get to business. So the first thing is, um, you know, let's write the states. State one is I have 500 kilopascal as my pressure and my temperature is 200 degrees C. So what I typically do, as you know, is I go to A5 and I find a 500 kilopascal line and I look at my saturated temperature corresponding to that particular saturated pressure. And I find that to be 151.83 Celsius. Okay, so then as my temperature is higher than this value, it means that I have myself a superheated vapor. Um, and the superheated information is supplied in table A6, right? And I go to there, I look at, you know, 500 kilopascal, comma, 200 uh, Celsius, and I read my information, H, and that becomes 2855.8 kilojoule per kilogram. So now I can have, now I know my H inlet. So let me uh, rewrite the Q dot, the energy equation will be equal to M dot H exit plus V exit square over two plus GZ exit minus H inlet plus V inlet square by two plus GZ inlet the parenthesis for a good measure um, and I thought I said that it was adiabatic and as you know that there will be no inlet or outlet in terms of the work in or work out that I can extract from it so and the, you know the left hand side is zero so I don't have to worry about it as I mentioned in the previous segment the pressure uh, potential energy is unnegligible so I get myself this kind of an equation H e plus V exit by 2 will be equal to H e H i plus V inlet by 2 the velocity square by 2 Okay, and as you know, the velocity information is supplied to me, so I should be good to go. So let's write it H exit plus 700, very large, right? It will be equal to H inlet, which is 2855.8. Remember, this is kilojoule per kilogram, so you have to either multiply this by 1000 or divide this by 1000, right? So I'll, I'll do the second one uh, so that I'm consistent, I'm working with something with kilojoules, okay? Plus Inlet is 30 squared by 2,000, okay? Then, you know, when I punch this into the calculator, I get myself HE as 
kilojoule per kilogram. Okay, now for state two, I know my age. 2611.25 kilojoule per kilogram. I, I said this, you know, let's call it 2H2 because I said H1 for the inlet. So what I will do, I also know the pressure. It's 200 kilopascal. The question gives to me. So guess what I'm going to do? I will go to A5 and I will look at the line for 200 kilopascal and I look at my H of the fluid or rather the liquid which is given as 544.721 kilojoule per kilogram and I will also look at my HG and that will be 2706.3 kilojoule per kilogram okay and I am looking at this number if it fits between those two it means I'm in the uh, mixture region right and you can see this number is right in between those two that means that I'm in the mixture region okay um, and while I'm there, I'm going to write this because it's going to come in handy. It's listed in the table there. 2201.6 kilojoule per kilogram. Okay. Then, what do you think my, you know, the question is asking about saturated or rather the temperature at the exit. So then, as I know that I'm in a saturated uh, mixture region, so now I know that there will be one particular uh, temperature that corresponds to 200 kilopascal, and that actually is 120.21 degrees C. So that will be the answer to a particular temperature question I have. And now I have to find my x value and then I refer back to my uh, notes and I have this hf plus x a f g. Kind of memorize this, okay, this is very often that we use. So then let me go back. 544.71 plus x times, do you see now why I write hfg as well? So I can simply copy and paste. Be careful, be, be your, your units be consistent, everything is kilojoule and the, the, the H that I have here is 2611.25, everything is kilojoule and the X is non-dimensional, so when I find it, I'll get this to be 0 0.95 as my X value, okay? Alright, so that was one example. Uh, let me copy paste the second example I want to do from this segment as well. We'll come back. So let's do another question. This time around, it's important. It's given to me as air. And there's an adiabatic diffuser. It's a diffuser. It's adiabatic. And that cross-sectional area is given. The uh, temperature of the inlet is given. And the velocity at the inlet is given. So I have my VI as 700 feet per second. I also call this V1. Um, and if the exit velocity, so I know my V2 is 100 feet per per uh, second. Find the temperature at the exit. So the inlet temperature is given, outlet exit uh, temperature is being asked. Okay. As we remember the, uh, from the previous segments, or rather the module, we know that the uh, the H uh, enthalpy as well as the internal energy is only a function of temperature for ideal gases. Okay. So that will make my. That's why I didn't give you any pressure information. But anyways, let's proceed. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have this TS100 Fahrenheit, but so let's convert this to Rankine. So that's going to be 100 plus 459.67. I hope you do know this number, 559.67 Rankine. That's what I have. The best thing to do over here is to look at the Chengal at the back of the book, Appendix 2 in this particular case, because it's English units. A17E lists the uh, air as a function of the temperatures. So they give the H over there. So I simply go there and I pick up the temperature is 560, you can imagine, very close, right? Um, I'm going to get my H1, uh, in this particular case, to be 133.86 BTU per pound mass, right? Okay, good. And from the previous question, I'm not going to do the whole thing about the uh, energy, but this is what I get, right? H1 plus V1 squared by 2, H2 is being asked. V2 is 100 squared by 2. Um, okay, uh, let's pretend I'm making a mistake. 133.86 plus 700 squared by 2. Okay, tell me what's wrong here. Okay, time's up. So what is wrong over here is the unit of this is B2 per mass, right? Isn't it? That's what I told you for H1, right? B2 per pound mass. What is the unit of this? This is feet squared per second squared. Are they ident identical? No, they're not. So I have to do some kind of a conversion, okay? And the conversion is, you should know this, um, feet per second square will be equal to one BTU per pound mass. So you can see BTU per pound mass is a very huge number, okay? 
So I'm sure at initially you were thinking, wow, the 700 is huge square of it compared to this value. Well, now you can see that I'm going to divide this by 25 or 37, 25 or 37. So you can see what's happening over here. When I plug this into the calculator, H2 is equal to 143.45 BTU per pound mass. Okay, so now I know my H2. So then I go to a 17E and I look at which particular temperature corresponds to 143.45 and it's right around 600 Rankin. So that will be the answer to this question. Okay, thank you for watching this segment. Have a good day.